Hi everyone, my name is Julia Mayetta. We are so pleased that you all could join us for this week's lecture in volume three of our 12 week No Neuropsychology Didactic Series. Uh, this series brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. And we would like to thank our sponsors for their support of this series. Before we start, here are some disclaimers. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the speakers, uh, views of the speakers are their own. Questions for our panelists today can be submitted via the Q&A box that's on the lower left or the middle of your screen. And we will be recording today's lecture to post on our website later this week. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Grande, Dr. Michael Williams, and Dr. Suzanne Penna for today's lecture on career pathways in neuropsychology. Uh, to introduce each, first, Dr. Laura Grande is the Director of Clinical Neuropsychology and Director of the Clinical Neuropsychology Postdoctoral Fellowship at VA Boston Healthcare System. In addition to overseeing fellowship training, she is involved in and manages training in clinical neuropsychology more broadly at the internship and practicum levels. Her varied research interests include the development of cognitive screening measures, cognitive changes associated with close proximity blast exposures, and selective attention and inhibition. Next is Dr. Michael Williams, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and Director of the Measurement and Intervention for Neuropsychological Disorders, or MIND, laboratory at the University of Houston. The overarching goal of his research program is to improve patient-centered outcomes for people who have suffered brain injury. He completed his undergraduate studies at Morehouse College and earned his MA and PhD at Wayne State University. Uh, Dr. Williams completed his internship at the University of Washington School of Medicine and his postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is a licen uh, licensed clinical psychologist, consulting editor for clinical psychological science, member at large for the Houston Neuropsychological Society, and chair of the science committee for APA Division 22 Rehabilitation Psychology. And last but not least is Dr. Suzanne Penna, who is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist and associate professor in the Division of Rehabilitation Neuropsychology in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at Emory University. Before coming to Emory, she worked at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center and then at the Atlanta VA Medical Center from 2008 to 2014. Dr. Penna joined the faculty at Emory full-time in 2014 and has been teaching in the DPT program since 2012. She teaches both the interpersonal communications course as well as explorations of human behavior. She is currently the training director for the Neuropsychology Fellowship as well as the Neuropsychology Practicum and was awarded the, the Dr. Anthony Stringer Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2015. Her clinical specialty is in the assessment of cognitive and emotional functioning in individuals with acquired brain injury and other neurological disorders. For today's lecture, we are going to cover several different topics. Um, so each presenter will answer some of the following questions as well as questions from you, the audience. Um, so first question we're gonna start with is what was your training and career path? Um, then we'll go over what do you do now, what do you like about it, advice you would give a trainee who's interested in becoming uh, a neuropsychologist in your position. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone, um, and we'll just go in the same order that we introduced you all in. So Dr. Grande, what was your training and career path? Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> You might prefer it that I was muted after after I start talking. Um, I think my my career path was maybe a little bit different than than a lot of folks. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I was really um, thinking about going into into teaching, and it, well, education was my um, was my major with a, with a minor in psychology. Um, and it just so happened that there were no teaching jobs or very few teaching jobs in the Boston area at that time. So I ended up taking a research assistant position um, and loved it. And I was a research assistant for a neuropsychologist at the, at the VA, the VA that I'm at now. 
Um, and I stayed there for six years as a research assistant um, and learned all that I could. So I know that's probably longer than most people stay on as research assistants, but I, I felt like I was learning so much and I didn't necessarily have that background as an undergrad. Um, so I stayed there as, <laughs> for six years and then um, decided I wanted to uh, apply for graduate school. So um, I applied to a slew of schools, um, ended up at the University of Florida where I did my, my graduate training, um, and then went back to the VA for my internship uh, and my postdoc. Uh, and they can't get rid of me because I'm still there now. <laughs> so that's my sort of indirect path to where I am now. Dr. Williams? My path was a, a little bit more straightforward, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, I attended a Morehouse College, uh, which is historically black college for men, um, all men. So, <laughs> so that was an interesting experience. Um, and, and while I was there, I, I knew I wanted to be a psychologist and um, I didn't quite fully understand the field as much as I do today, but I knew I needed to learn about research uh, to get into graduate school. And so um, I worked with the TRIO programs and Ronnie Muneer program to identify different research opportunities. Um, uh, Mr. Brock Mayers, who was the director of the programs at that time, was very helpful and kind of supporting me and kind of encouraging me and kind of helping to figure out my way and stuff like that. And so that was super helpful. And I, uh, actually started out in my first research lab at a National Primate Research Center uh, at Emory University. So I was working with uh, Dr. Robert Hampton. Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, you know, and then you get to say, hey, I work with monkeys. That's what I do all day. Um, so, I mean, that's, you have a lot of fun stories uh, with that. Um, but I knew I wanted to work with humans. And so, you know, I, I kind of left uh, undergrad and went straight to uh, graduate school uh, in uh, Dr. Lisa Rapport's lab at Wayne State University, where I studied uh, individual traumatic brain injury. Um, and I was very fortunate to um, also do research with Robin, Dr. Robin Hanks at the Rehabilitation Institute of Michigan. So a lot of uh, fun times and great experiences there. And I've been on that uh, TBI trajectory ever since. Um, I uh, went to University of Washington School of Medicine for my internship and I have a uh, traumatic brain injury models in there as well. And so I was able to sit in, in those research groups and kind of learn from them um, before going to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore where I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship in rehab and neuropsychology. Uh, one of the things that uh, is unique um, for me in neuropsychology is that my training started at REM. So rehab and neuropsychology were like one for me. So that rehab is definitely just flowing through my veins. Um, so I, I, had, I had to keep with that. Um, and uh, one of the things that was really nice about the internship and postdoc experiences that I've had is that research is definitely a, a part of the culture and environment um, in supporting me. And so I think that really set me up nicely to transition back to a traditional academic environment for, for my career. Um, so yeah. Okay, so um, I'm Suzanne Penna, and I kind of had a combination of both of your sort of career trajectories. I don't know, I think I fall somewhere in the middle. Um, so I actually went to Emory University as an undergrad, and yes, I do realize I'm still there now. Um, I, I kind of joke, I call it the Emory Mafia, like you try to get out, but they just pull you right back in. The VA is like that as well. Um, and Michael, I had to laugh because my roommate as an undergrad also worked at Yerkes Primate Center and she used to come in and be like, those monkeys threw poop at me again. You know, and I would just be like, hit the shower. <laughs> like, it's, that's great, go, go shower. Um, so I, I did chuckle a little bit at that. Um, I was actually, as an undergrad, really torn between um, going to school in clinical psychology or going to medical school. So I think it's a, you know, a lot of people I think struggle with this. And I think um, my, my first job out of college was as a research assistant um, in the Department of Psychiatry at Emory. And it was there that I realized that I really had zero interest in anything from the neck down. So I think that that kind of determined it for me. Um, but I was very interested in sort of the medical or biological aspects of psychology rather than sort of your more traditional clinical psychology. And I didn't know that neuropsych existed. So it really wasn't until I started grad school at Georgia State University where um, I realized there was an entire subspecialty of neuropsychology and it was, 
you know, like the angels started singing, the clouds parted, and it was like, this is what you will do. Um, and that was it. I was hooked. Um, so, you know, I, I did start out as a straight clinical psychologist looking at sort of, um, you know, biological mechanisms of depression, and I just completely shifted into full neuropsych. Um, I ended up doing um, my... Um, my internship at Yale University and fellowship at um, University of Alabama in Birmingham, where is, um, I really got interested in traumatic brain injury, which was also a TBI model systems site, similar to RIM, similar to you know, all of these other places. So these large multi-center sites, um, you can see how they sort of, people tend to know each other through those things. Um, and I kind of loved severe TBI. It was really, I loved um, particularly inpatient rehab work um, and very similar to Michael, sort of the, the rehab and the neuropsych really kind of went hand in hand. It was like, you know, very hands-on, very um, sort of, okay, how do, we, how do we deal with what's going on here in the moment? How do cognitive impairments translate into behavioral problems? How do you manage that? And I kind of thrived on it. Um, so around the time that I was finishing fellowship, um, there was, you know, people may remember, but there was this huge scandal at Walter Reed about all of these people walking around with brain injuries who were, you know, not being cared for, you know, all this, that, and the other. And I was like, I, I, I do head injuries. So I, um, I applied for a job there. It was the weirdest job interview I ever had. I was doing like these three day academic talks at all of these places and, in a half hour at Walter Reed, they're like, you're hired. So that's kind of, that's where I ended up. It was a fantastic job. I loved every single aspect of it, um, you know, and I did not see myself sort of kind of taking that military trajectory, but um, I loved it. Great job. Um, and from there, I kind of went from um, Department of Defense to VA, where I kind of stayed in traumatic brain injury, but this time more at the mild end of severity. Um, and, you know, and the only reason I left that job at Walter Reed is Emory came calling and, um, you know, my mentor at Emory, Tony Stringer, um, I would probably stand in front of a bus for that man. And he called and he said, we've got a job. And I said, I'm coming, pack my bags and, um, started off full time at the VA and then just sort of transitioned over. And since 2014, I've been full time over at Emory, um, doing more of sort of the academic medical model, but still sort of have my toe in over at the VA with um, the mild TBI program there. So that's my, that's my story. Thank you all so much. It's so nice to hear kind of the similarities and the differences in your trajectories and kind of where you're at now. Um, I guess related to that, what exactly do you do now? Some of our um, viewers are interested in kind of the daily tasks. What is the nitty gritty of your week? Um, and what do you like about your current position? I guess we'll start with Dr. Grande. Sure. Um, I do a lot of different things. <laughs> I do a lot of different things. And I would say that um, some weeks are pretty consistent in terms of I do the same things. And then other weeks, it's it, it can be really varied. So um, I as the director of the neuropsychology um, consult service, um, that, that's really what I do is I manage our outpatient clinics and we have, so we're at, th we're at three um, different VA campuses. So VA Boston is, is three different medical centers and we have outpatient uh, clinics at two of those. So um, I manage those clinics um, with staff and, and our trainees. Um, it's primarily outpatient. Some of that has changed over the course of the pandemic and we're doing a little bit more inpatient. Um, but that's a big chunk of, of what I do. So basically what that involves is people from lots of different services, typically psychiatry, neurology, geriatrics, and uh, other psychologists will send referrals to our clinic. Um, and I'll review them and determine if they're appropriate for neuropsych testing. You know, the uh, please administer uh, Rorschach is not one that I will often accept. <laughs> I'll say, no, no, we won't be doing that, but we can help you in other ways. Um, and determine, you know, sort of what, what clinic will, what clinic will they fit in? What will they fit in best? Um, 
I, we also, we have a large number of trainees. Um, and so we have a pretty strong um, didactics and lecture series that we do. So we, well, Thursdays are education day. Um, and on Thursdays, we, um, before the pandemic anyways, we would try to have our neurobehavior rounds one once a month where we'd have a, an interesting patient come in and have a discussant interview the patient um, and do some bedside testing and some teaching. Um, and then we also have a lecture series that's twice a month and a seminar series and a didactic series for our, for our neuropsych trainees. Um, kind of in and around those sort of two main parts of my week, um, I will see some patients myself. Um, I'm also supervising trainees and doing a fair amount of administrative stuff. Some of it's more exciting and fun than other administrative stuff. Um, but uh, you know, I, I would say as my career has gone on, I'm, I'm doing more administrative activities and probably less of the hands-on um, activities. And I'll, I'll leave it at that so, that so that Michael and Suzanne can talk. So my day-to-day -day is, is quite varied um, in a lot of ways. Um, which is which is nice and fun. Um, in short, sometimes I tell people, you know, I just read and write all day. That's what I do. <laughs> um, and it sums up a lot of things that I do. Um, I'm either reading or writing for the most part. Um, but I would say the one of the, the highlights of, of my job is I think mentorship and, and working with students. And so I think for me, I enjoy the, the teaching aspect of being a university professor um, and being able to engage with undergraduate and graduate students in that mentorship piece. That's like the, um, I think the, the key to, to one in this position. And so, um, you know, pre-COVID, I just start was starting to get into the classroom teaching clinical assessment too, um, which is the hands-on measures for cognition, academic achievement, personality, and so forth. Um, so that was pretty nice. We would get in the clinic, we would kind of have volunteers come in. And so I would, you know, have the experience of supervising clinical cases, but not real clinical cases. So it was still kind of fun in that regard. I had like a little bit of tone in the clinical, but I'm still working on the teaching and mentorship. Um, and so that was really nice. Um, I started uh, a new course, uh, Psychology at PM&R um, at University of Houston. So that's really nice to kind of bring rehab into the educational system very early on. Um, so that's really nice. It was fun to develop that course. Um, and so I'll be teaching that again this fall. Um, and so that was just really fun. I had the, the opportunity to bring in some clinicians and some researchers that I know into the classroom to kind of speak, which was really fun and nice discussions, um, really talking about disability advocacy and so forth. Uh, students' perspectives are just phenomenal in terms of ideas they've had. Um, and then, you know, some using some natural experiences that uh, came up. So in uh, Houston, we had a snowstorm this year, which was <laughs> crazy for a variety of reasons, uh, other than the fact that it was Houston, but it was an opportunity to get them to, to think about how would this be for, you know, a person with disabilities, you know, and what does that mean? What was the infrastructure like? And so just being able to have discussions like that in the classroom very early on, I think it has been super powerful and impactful. Uh, the students have been able to share that with me and their, their classmates. So I'm really excited to see how, you know, we're able to grow this class and what we're offering at UH. Um, you know, uh, the, the next best thing I have to do is research. Um, you know, I get to ask questions all day. I get to think about, you know, the whys, the hows, um, and, and what we're going to do next. I think that's uh, super fun. Um, I'm building my lab. So I have uh, one graduate student right now working with me at a day. Um, and I recruited uh, another student uh, from Georgia State, Tobaloba Quadri. <laughs> Uh, so she'll be joining us this fall. Um, I have an undergraduate research assistant, um, Hamsini Ajan. Uh, she's at UT Dallas. Uh, she's been in the lab virtually. She's from Houston, but uh, attending school in Dallas. And so that, the fact that we were virtual kind of freed up some opportunities to do things in a different way. Um, so that's really nice. I have other students from the University of Houston um, join my lab. Uh, which is really nice. So in the Karma Lab, um, run by Dr. Medina, um, Andrea Ochoa Lopez, she's joining my lab uh, pretty regularly and contributing um, in various ways. Um, so it's really nice to kind of mentor students in different projects, um, developing posters and papers and, and things like that, discussing the research and, and the gaps in literature um, and how we can address it. Um, so I think that's has been super fun for me. Um, 
surprisingly, I didn't realize I would have as much administrative responsibilities as I do. <laughs> so building a lab actually takes a significant amount of work. <laughs> Um, so, you know, thinking about managing a budget, doing orders and purchasing, kind of planning, designing, you know, not a strong suit of mine, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a part of it, right? Um, so ordering lab furniture, um, and this is amidst the COVID, so things have been slowed down, but I have my order together, so hopefully I'll have furniture soon for my lab. Um, <laughs> uh, so that'll be pretty cool. Um, and then uh, another thing I think, um, that it uh, is definitely key to the academic environment is service. Um, and so people are typically involved in a variety of roles. And so uh, being able to serve as a consulting editor or viewer for uh, journals, um, you know, being able to serve on committees like the Houston Neuropsychological Society, uh, Division 22 for uh, rehab psychology um, and, and all those other activities, I think has just been really uh, fun and engaging and allows me to kind of give back and get the energy um, that I need to kind of keep doing this work. So you know, a lot of different things. And so each day can be very different. It could be a few hours of meetings. It could be a research meeting. It could be, you know, just writing on a paper. It could just be reading articles and getting caught up on the literature, um, writing grants, reviewing grants, a variety of different things. So, yeah. Excellent. Cool job. <laughs> so um, I, uh, my job, I'm in an academic medical center, so um, I'm on the School of Medicine side of things over at Emory, and um, it's sort of um, a little bit different than Michael's job in that I don't actually work with um, graduate students in a primary research mentorship role. So um, I'm actually the training director of the um, clinical program, clinical neuropsych programs here. So we have practicum students from four different local universities. We have in, um, an internship program, which I'm the director of the neuropsych track, and we have a neuropsych fellowship, which I'm the director of. So the type of teaching I do is more of a medical, medical school model in that I'm primarily supervising students doing assessments. So four days a week um, are clinical days for us. So Monday through Thursday are clinical days. Uh, Fridays are supervision, didacting, like uh, didactic. I said, you know, sort of like all teaching all the time on Fridays. Um, and the rest of my job sort of falls in between all of that. So, um, which I think you're probably hearing a theme from all three of us, you know, it's sort of, you're juggling a lot of balls in the air at any given time. Um, and how we do our teaching, our research, and our clinical work looks a little bit different in each site, but all of us are sort of engaged in, in some way um, to different percentages. So I am actually uh, lucky enough to mentor a couple of students in their dissertation projects, although I am not their sort of primary mentor because they're obviously their graduate programs are doing that, but you know they're using um, data from studies that I'm working on or, or things like that. And I really enjoy that. In fact, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, one of my, um, I guess, research slash teaching endeavors is to develop, um, to develop clinical neuropsychology training in Sub-Saharan Africa. And to that, um, and I was in Rwanda two years ago teaching. Um, and one of my students in that program, who's a clinical psychologist is now going for her PhD and I'm on her dissertation committee. And it's just really cool that, you know, I'm, I'm able to do that um, in sort of an academic medical setting. Um, so really, I think, Yes, I'm doing clinical work, but the clinical work I'm doing is alongside students. So, you know, for example, today I had two patients and I had a fellow on one of the cases and a practicum student on another one of the cases. And we sort of do them together. Um, so yes, that's sort of how we get the clinical needs met, but also the training needs. Um, in terms of formal teaching, um, I, you know, I used to teach formal classes in the Department of Physical Therapy. Um, it was, you know, basically it was sort of applied neuroanatomy, like your, your patient is amnestic, how are you going to do physical therapy with them? Your patient has aphasia, how are you going to do physical therapy with them? Um, given that my administrative duties have increased, um, again, you may notice a theme here. Uh, I, I've sort of handed that off to more junior faculty, uh, but I do miss teaching. You know, in terms of what makes my heart sing professionally, I really consider myself a teacher more so than anything else. You know, I love my clinical work, I love my research, but I'm a teacher. 
Um, and, and I'm lucky enough now that I'm sort of um, mid-career and can really sort of focus on that. I don't have to constantly sort of build my resume in terms of publish, 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 which quite frankly, if you do pursue an academic career, that is kind of how you have to start. Um, that's what gets you in the door. Once you're in the door, you know, you can start to shape things a little bit more. So um, that's my day to day. Um, kind of like everybody else, it's a little like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but then again, you know, life would be boring if we weren't. So there we go. That's a common thing I've been hearing lately, especially with COVID, it's extra fire hosey. <laughs> really uh, wet, really, really yeah. wet. <laughs> yes. Hopefully it cools down a little bit. Um, next question on our list is, what advice would you give for a trainee who's interested in um, being a neuropsychologist in your position? Mm. Am I going first again? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, You're always so, first, Laura. <laughs> can, could you repeat the question, please, Julia? <laughs> sure. So what advice would you give a trainee who's kind of trying to get to your position now, basically? Okay. So I would say, I would say take advantage of all the opportunities you possibly can. And that can be, it can be challenging because saying yes to everything means that there's a fire hose on full blast all the time, as Suzanne mentioned. Um, but you never know where something might lead you. You never know what you know, if somebody asks you to review an article or somebody asks you to be on a committee, um, I would say, say yes, unless it's so far outside of your area of interest or expertise, um, I, I would say, say yes, because I, you, again, it's, um, you'll get to meet new people, you'll get to, you know, obtain new skills and do new things that will, you, you don't know where they're going to take you. Um, and I think that that's, and that can come in all different ways. So that can come both with clinical work, you know, at the VA, we may, we're starting a new um, heart and lung uh, transplant um, program with the Brigham and women. And so, you know, we've kind of put that out for our trainees, you know, do they want to be a part of that? And yes, they overwhelmingly want to be a part of that. And I think this is great. They'll be kind of on the cutting edge with us as we're sort of de developing that program more and that collaboration more. Um, and so I, I, I would just, that would be what I would encourage folks to do. And also, um, even if you're in graduate school, because I, I was in this experience a, a, a couple times in graduate school that I was, you know, potentially working on a project that I wasn't necessarily something that I was wholeheartedly in love with, but take those skills, right? So that may not be the topic that I want, but I learned a ton about you know, submitting a grant, or I learned a lot about how do you manage a study that's on an inpatient unit. Take that and 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 take it with you where you go, and then you can apply it to to what you want to do ultimately. Okay, Michael, it's your turn. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, so. I, th I think it's somewhat um, challenging um, uh, because I think a traditional academic position, they're just not as available um, as clinical positions. Um, so I, I think if, if, if you want to be an academic uh, neuropsychology, I would say plan for it um, as best you can, but be flexible, right? It may not look exactly how you want it to look. It may not have everything that you want it to have. Um, but, you know, kind of that planning portion, you focus on what's key for you, what's, what's going to be critical in terms of your day to day and what you want to do and what you need to, to live a comfortable life and, and be productive in the ways in which you, you hope to be. So, um, you know, uh, another thing to think about is to uh, assess and adjust where you are. Um, so if you are, you know, doing something, you don't like it, take stock of that, take inventory, like, oh, I, I kind of don't like that aspect of this. 
Um, you know, each academic institution uh, is unique. <laughs> the culture, the environment, um, what they expect of you, um, and those things matter. So paying attention to that and what you like, uh, that's going to be super important. Um, and, and one thing that I think goes hand in hand with all of these things is, is mentorship. Um, so making sure you identify good mentors to, to help you along the way. Um, you know, have them look over things you submit, your CV regularly, opportunities that come up, um, ask them to identify opportunities for you that would be good for you to get to the next stage or step of your career. Um, and despite all of it, stay encouraged and be optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's probably easier said than done sometimes. Um, so, so just to kind of put it out there, I, you know, I talked about my first job out out of college. You know, I was a, a research assistant. Well, the reason I took that job is I got rejected from all fifteen grad schools that I applied to. Um, and you know, so I was like, all right, you know, and I said, what do I need? What do I need? You need research. You know, everyone's like, you got to show that you can do research because again, these programs that you're applying to. They're, they're preparing you for a research career. And I knew I kind of wanted an academic medical center because I liked that sort of aspect of things. I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do. So I spent that whole year getting a lot of research, um, research experience. And I applied to 15 more grad schools. And the only reason I got into the one that I did is because two people who they accepted said no. And I was the third person on the list. So, you know, I think what Laura was saying, as in, you know, it, it can be discouraging, but find a job gaining experience. You know, it's like, it's perfectly fine if you're not doing what you want the first time out of the gate. And yeah, I get it. It's hard. Um, you need money. You know, research assistant jobs are really good for giving you money. Um, I would say, try to find something like that rather than like, you know, finding like, uh, you know, a retail job that may give you good experience with something, you know, might give you some money, but doesn't really put you forward in terms of your career. Um, I think the other thing that, you know, in terms of getting where I was, I did not take the most direct route. I think a lot of people who are going traditional academic medicine start like, you know, and it's grant, 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 um, and it's publish, publish, publish. And I had, you know, a pretty good record of publication. Um, and, um, then I had kids and I had a husband who, uh, was not going to be bringing home the bacon. You know, I knew that I was going to be the primary caregiver and it needed to be me and I needed to feed my family. So, you know, that was another reason why my original job was at the VA and it was clinical. Um, and I always had this goal. Okay. I want to be in an academic medical center. And even though I'm in a job that's 100% clinical right now, how do I get there? So while I was in that clinical position in the TBI clinic, I started reaching out to the researchers there. Hey, do you want to work on this? Hey, do you want to work on this? So I sort of built my research from the ground up while doing the clinical stuff. Um, and it worked out that way. You know, oh, hey, I've got this really cool clinical population um, that we really haven't studied. Let's do something with this data. You know, so just because you're in a clinical job, make yourself a database, you know, you can still do these things. So I think, you know, it can be disheartening, particularly people who are on sort of the grant path and you put in this amazing grant, and it's this great study and you're like, look at my amazing study. And you come back and they're like, your study sucks. Um, you know, and you just, it's like demoralizing. And, and I mean, at least it was for me, I don't know for other people, but, you know, I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, let me see if I can get at this a different way. Let me see if I can do this a different way. Let me see if I can hook myself onto somebody else's study, you know, establish myself as a name and then go from there. So, um, you know, I, I kind of came into this a little bit backwards, but again, it was always sort of my work with TBI in that sort of area, even though it wasn't the research that I wanted, it was the work that I wanted, it was the population that I wanted. And that built my way into the job that I'm in now, if that makes sense. Can I just add something to, to what Suzanne was saying? And, and Suzanne, when you when you brought up the fact that you know you you started a family, right? Because yeah. that that can be that can be a challenge. Um, because absolutely you want it all, but maybe you, you can't have it all right then, right? And so I think what, what she talked about in terms of, you know, she knew where what her goal was, but this is where she was right now, leading her to to Emory, right? Leading her yeah. to wherever. And, and I think that that's 
I don't know. I just think that's an important thing because it's, it, you, I think we all, like, I was like, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to have this fantastic job. And I think part of it was a little bit piecing some things together. And Michael was saying this too, that like, no job is 100% exactly perfect there. You just have like, what can you put up with? <laughs> what are you willing to do? Um, and I think just kind of keep keeping that in mind and thinking that like you, you can have a family and you can do it, but you know, thinking about what's your priority at, at a given time. Going back to Maslow, you know, what were my needs? I needed a roof over my head. I needed a steady income, you know, I, and, and, you know, yes, I needed fulfilling work, but it was good enough until it was the job that I wanted. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it's sort of the what's okay for now and knowing that sometimes it takes longer and, you know, and it was a choice I made. I was like, you know what, this is what I'm going to do for now. I know I could do something different, but I want something else out of my life right now. And that's what's taking priority for me. I think that's a really good point. And especially at least at my stage of training, I feel like we talk about training and career trajectories as like a linear path and listening to all of you, it, it really brings up the point about flexibility and kind of sticking with where you're at in the moment and seeing where you want to go from that and using what you have, as well as the benefits of mentorship and networking and knowing, knowing how to get what you need from the different locations that you're at. So I really appreciate that. Um, for the next question, we had someone submit this uh, question. What types of experience, um, for example, publications, grants, leadership, clinical, are more or less beneficial for each career path. So what experiences, for example, should a job candidate emphasize for a position like yours? And anyone can answer. We don't have to go in a specific order. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> all of it to all of our positions is what I'm going to say. But I'll let Michael and Suzanne, I think you know, every place wants, wants the ideal candidate. They want the person who has the clinical training. They want the person who's had funding and who has research and who's a collaborator and who's been on committees. So um, I, I would say try to do all of those things in some way, if, if you can. I, I mean, that's my, that's my I don't know, short and dirty answer. I don't know what my, what Suzanne would add. I think I would agree. I think um, I think it depends on what specific type of career you want within. So, you know, even in an academic medical setting, which I'm in, there are three tracks in terms of promotion. There's a research, primarily research only track. Um, there is a clinical track that's primary, and then there's a medical educator track, and you can go up for promotion on any of those three. So if you know, like, I am a researcher, and that's all I want to do, I hate clinical people, I hope I never see another patient on the, like for the rest of my life, then you want a, you know, you want to start applying for grants while you're in grad school. You want to start, you know, you really want to build up those publications, um, and you want to have a clear research focus. I think what was hardest for me when I went up for promotion was when you look at my track record, I don't really have a really clear like, you know, this is specifically my area of research in this little tiny area in this domain. I am not like the queen of X and Y in neuropsychology. And a lot of places that's what they're looking for, particularly more traditional academic settings. Um, what I did have was a lot of teaching experience and leadership experience, um, and that's kind of what I emphasize. So, you know, and again, in addition to the training director, I'm also um, the treasurer of ABSEN. I'm also the president of AIDSEN. So, you know, I'm, I got involved in neuropsychology at sort of a, a, a national level because that's really where my interest was. So I think probably when you're in grad school, you have some idea of what you really like to do. Um, and so flesh that out a little bit more, but don't forget the other stuff too. And as much as people are like, oh my God, I can't do all of that. You actually can because grad school teaches you how to, I mean, you have to, you have to teach in grad school. You have to do research in grad school, at least, you know, of some form or fashion. And, um, you have to do clinical work in grad school. Like what are all these assistantships we're doing? You know, so you're all, you already have the groundwork. So I don't want people to panic um, because this is stuff that you're already doing um, and, and get things, you know, you just sort of flesh it out a little bit more as your career progresses. Yeah, I concur. 
um, you know, with Laura and Suzanne, uh, do all the things. <laughs> um, <especially laughs> um, consider where you are, what your values are, and what, what you enjoyed most at the time and where you hope to go. But I would say um, it, know the institution you're applying to and, and let that kind of help you determine what, what skill sets you want to highlight. Um, you know, because in certain places, they may not care at all about teaching, <laughs> um, you know, so, but in other places they might, you know, they might appreciate that. They might appreciate student engagement. They may appreciate what you bring to the table in terms of research mentorship and training um, and those things. So I would say it really isn't just a, a specific job type, but more so a job type and institutional culture that you want to think about when you're determining what to highlight. That is a super good point. Yeah. So match your CV for the job that you want. And even if you're casting a broad net for jobs, research the place and tweak your CV for that particular job. Thank you for that. Um, the next question that is on our list is a bit more general, but um, what's something that you wish you had known prior to starting graduate school? And I'm gonna add another part in here, prior to starting your career post postdoc. It's okay if there's not anything either. <laughs> I mean, I think honestly, for me, I think recognizing just how long of a road it is, um, it is a little bit demoralizing to see your friends who go into different career paths, like get married, have nice jobs, get cars, um, buy a house. And you know, you're 30 and you're still making like 30 grand a year. Um, so, you know, I think I intuitively knew what that what was like, but then I sort of experienced it. Um, and I think the other thing I wish I knew, I think this again goes along to having a family again, um, knowing that the best time to start a family is whenever you're ready to start a family. There is no good time. Just like there's no best time, there's no whatever time. Like people are like, you should wait until you're finished with this or finished with that. No, the time to have a family is when you feel like you want to have a family because you make it work. Everybody makes it work. That's it. That's all I got. That's great. Um, all I can say is I wish I knew about ordering chairs. <laughs> I mean, I, there, I was never a class of that, but I mean, you know, I think that's something that's important, right? When, when you are building an actual lab space, you have to think about those small, minute details, thinking about spacing, you know, uh, thinking about planning, like how, how would you want workspace to be set up, you know, to be functional for people? What would the meeting space look like for you? Um, those kind of things are things I really didn't think about beforehand, uh, but writing and reading and mentorship, like those are things that you know about, we think about. Um, I think that was a, a, probably the biggest surprise for me. <laughs> Awesome, thank you all. Um, the next question has to do with the balance between uh, clinical psychology in your work and clinical neuropsychology. So specifically for those of us in training who wish to practice as neuropsychologists and also hope to integrate, for example, rehabilitation or therapy into our assessment work. I'm, I'm guessing Michael and Suzanne probably have, I mean, they'll have a lot more to say about the rehab piece. And I think that it, it may vary where you are. So I think certainly at the VA, it's strongly encouraged. And I think, you know, we often feel that our, our feedback can sometimes be the, in, the initial entry into a, a therapeutic relationship or into uh, some, say cog remediation. So, so I think that that's strongly encouraged where um, where I am at the VA. I think, you know, our, our billing system is a little bit different than other places. And so I think in some ways it's easy for us to kind of spread ourselves around uh, into, different, into different areas. So I, I think that that, um, that is certainly something that I've kept a little bit of as I go along. I carry a couple of therapy patients myself um, and, and they're not necessarily neuropsych patients. They're patients who are dealing with anxiety or depression. Um, 
which of course can be neuropsych. I don't want to, I don't want to say that they aren't, but they are, they didn't come to me through neuro, our neuropsych clinic. Um, so I, I think that that's absolutely um, a possibility. And I think, you know, at, clinical neuropsychologists are trained as clinical psychologists first. Um, and, you know, you don't, you don't, in most programs, you don't graduate with a degree in clinical neuropsychology. You graduate with a degree in psychology. And I think, uh, I think keeping that framework in both your neuropsych work and work that you're doing outside your neuropsych clinic is helpful. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. I agree. That's a, that's a good uh, jumping point for me. Um, because I was in a, my, my training program was just that you're a clinical psychologist and you specialize in neuropsychology. And so it's kind of that added layer of skill set. Um, but that base is always going to be the clinical psychology that's with you. Um, and I would say what's pretty cool is that I teach the clinical assessment course to all the students in the clinical program. So year one, I have the opportunity to touch all the students. And so I definitely have a little bit of my rehab neuro influence <laughs> on the training piece there, uh, but also just talk about just general clinical assessment, um, you know, cognition, mood, and, and how that relates to therapy, how that relates to, um, you know, different experiences that people may have with other clinicians after you, what it looks like to, to do a feedback session, have a warm handoff, um, getting people in the door, you know, like the, the calls, the, that initial contact, how you work with people to get them into the door. So having people actually show for the appointment that matters um, and, and how we operate, how warm we are, how inviting we are um, is important. And so thinking about those um, soft skills, I think I, you know, try to talk about that a little bit in the classroom and so forth as well. I think anybody who is working in um, a patient setting is going to be using their clinical skills. Um, I think as a neuropsychologist, um, Anytime I think people want to do therapy or incorporate rehab, it's going to be welcome. It's just an issue of whether or not you want to do that. Um, me personally, not really a therapist. <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember thinking distinctly in grad school when I was in my first therapy practicum, like talking to a patient and I'm thinking, man, you need to see a good psychologist. Um, so I, I just, I really love assessment. I love doing feedbacks. I love kind of, you know, and then I love backing out. Um, you know, even in the inpatient work, I like it because it's time limited and it's very sort of practical and hands-on. Um, but of the people that like to do more of that therapy and that rehab work, I have found that if you want it, people will love to give it to you. Um, there is never an issue of, you know, somebody saying, you know what, I really just want you to do just assessment. Like you're, you're really not going to get that because you do have that specialized skill set and that you can work with people who have brain impairment. You can work with those families. So, you know, I think I can't imagine a situation where if you wanted to do it, it wouldn't be available. Thank you all. Um, the next question is from one of our advanced doctoral students who is in a program that has limited neuropsych practicum opportunities. I know this is a relatively common occurrence. What would you suggest for this person um, who plans to apply to a neuropsych specific internship given that they don't have that much um, available to them in their current location? Is there a way that you can find other opportunities to, to do practicum? I guess I think that um, that experience is, is important in your application for, for internship. Um, and and uh, is there a way that you can, you, can round, you can round that out? Are there other opportunities for you to maybe work with a neuropsychologist, even in a private practice, if you're not in, in, in an academic um, medical setting? Um, because I, I you know, it's, it's breadth of training and it's, and people want to, people want to see that you, that you have lots of different experiences. So, um, it, you know, if, if you're in a place where that's possible, I, I would encourage you to do that. I will say, I think honestly, COVID has maybe made it a little bit easier um, because so many people now are incorporating telehealth. Um, you know, I've definitely had a lot of students apply for our internship at Emory who have really tried to like take things from a lot of different places. I mean, I've had people like drive two hours to try to get to, you know, a neuropsych location just to get some experience. And I gotta say, I really, 
I respect the hustle. Like I really do. I mean, you know, like this is somebody who was clearly trying to work for it. And, you know, when those opportunities weren't there, they tried to find them. If the coursework wasn't there, they were like going to the NAN, you know, doing some of the NAN online stuff. They were, you know, trying to fit these experiences in, in other ways. And I think that that really shows your dedication to the field. Um, and so I think particularly now with COVID, the, the game has changed a little bit. Um, and reaching out to places that might be a couple of hours away, you know, obviously still within state lines because of the practicing issues, but hey, would you be willing to accept a practicum student like doing telehealth um, or, or things like that? Um, you know, I do think it is challenging, um, but I agree with Laura, you do need that breadth of experience. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're really going to extend yourself in one area, that's the area that I would extend myself. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And telehealth has also opened up more opportunities. So hopefully that'll be helpful for this person. Um, the next question has to do with applying to graduate school. So in your different positions, is it better to have a broad range of research experiences or only a few but more in-depth experiences? And does this vary perhaps across your different positions? In terms of the appl application itself? I, I guess, mm -hmm. well, I guess that's a good question. <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't. No, because I'm not on the admissions committee. I'm well, on the commissions committee for, for one of the graduate programs at, at BU. But I think what, um, what people take from the CV when you're applying is, here's, here's uh, proof that this person can kind of function in a real world, right? So, and, and this, not because my route to my career was different, but you know the idea that someone's gone to high school, college, and then going right to graduate school, they may never have been out in the real world and like had a job, had like a, had a nine to five job that, um, you know, they, they had to show initiative, they had to um, kind of manage a lot of tasks. And I think that that is oftentimes what a research assistant position can help you do. Gather some of those skills that are necessary for graduate school, but also that, hey, this is somebody who's dependable, trustworthy, somebody who, you know, can 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 get the job done, and so I I honestly don't know that if it if it's sort of you know multiple areas is better than diving in deep in one area. I think if you're really interested in working in a specific area and that's really what you want to pursue for your graduate school and life beyond, then then maybe it's helpful. But otherwise, I'm I I don't know. But I'd be interested to hear what my uh, Michael and Susan have to say. Um. I, I think it's really about the story you tell um, because the, not everybody's gonna have the same experience. And so, I mean, I think even from a viewing standpoint, you're comparing research lab X to research lab Y for different students all the time. And so it's not necessarily something that you can just compare across. And then I think most reviewers uh, are gonna just bear in mind that everybody's not gonna have the same opportunities. Um, and a, a big thing that, you know, people are going to know is that as an undergrad, you do not have the opportunity to really direct the research experiences you, you engage in. Um, so I, I think that if you find a lab that you like, that you gel with, that's in line with your trajectory or desired trajectory at the time, um, I would say soak that up as long as you're learning and also uh, demonstrating productivity. So um, one of the things that I, I, I talk about is if you've been in a lab for a year, um, you should maybe have like a product, like a poster, you know, or something to say that, oh, I was here and I was doing something. Um, I, I think that that's really helpful and it kind of sets you apart in that regard. Um, so, I mean, having that depth, that uh, additional time spent in the lab may allow you to get out some research products that can just highlight your achievement, your writing skills, your analytic skills, your engagement in the literature, whatever that may be. Um, so it, it's, it's a balance, um, but really in terms of how you want to tell your story and how that specific experience fits in with that. I would agree with that. And I would also say, honestly, either is fine. I think what people are looking for is, can you do research? Can you think like a scientist? Can you, you know, sort of 
um, are you familiar with the with the process of scientific research and the coursework is part of that but it is no substitute for actual experience you know and, and as michael says you know when you're an undergrad you just find a mentor that will let you in their lab and you do whatever it is that they tell you to do and people in grad school understand that you know obviously you can self-direct to some you know a certain degree but I will say when you're applying to grad school, you are not applying to the program, you are applying to work with a specific mentor. And people often forget that. So the most important thing to do when you are looking for a mentor is figure out who does the research that you want and are they taking students that year? And then is the work you're doing aligned with what they're doing? Because again, when on these entrance committees, yes, you know, it comes to like, you know, there's sort of a broad, like, yes, you should have X, Y, and Z in order to be looked at twice. But the most important thing is, you know, your mentor, you know, aspirational mentor is gonna go to bat for you. I want this person in my lab. Um, so, you know, like Michael was saying, tell your story, like, okay, reach out to that person. Hey, I've been really interested. Like I read this article that you did and, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's what's gonna get you in the door. Can I just, um, I see I said you wouldn't want me to have my microphone on, but just to add what to, what to, what to what Michael was saying too, is that I think that, um, you know, if you are in, in someone's lab, you know, ask them, is there, you know, can I work on a poster? You know, can't, because I think sometimes, and I would have been, been this way. I was this way in graduate school, like, oh, I, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not good enough to do that. Or maybe they don't want me to do that, but I'll tell you, people like to see that initiative. People want, and I, and I don't, you know, I, I think that you, you should be encouraged to do that, to seek that out. Is it an opportunity for me to do a poster? Can I present this somewhere at, you know, a college, you know, a college um, conference or something? So I, I would just support that entirely. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Definitely reaching out and asking what there is to be done. Oftentimes, at least in our lab, there's data that we've had ideas for that we just haven't gotten around to yet. And those are good projects that we can allow undergraduates to help lead. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left and this is obviously a much broader topic. So perhaps we'll have you back for another call later on. Um, but are there any um, differences in the funding models or salary structures at your different locations? Um, and then what types of negotiation advice might you provide? Obviously in brief, since we only have a couple minutes left. <laughs> VA is easy. <laughs> VA is, it is what it is, right? Like there's not a whole lot of negotiating, which is good and bad. So I would say, um, you know, it's based on your experience, whether you come in, you know, what grade and what, there may be some variability as to what step. So the VA system has like a grading system and it's like a GS11, a GS12, a GS13, GS14. Um, and there are kind of steps within each. Um, the steps may vary a little bit, but you know, across all VAs, people come in at, this, at the same point. So it makes it easy. So I'll shut up. I actually love the VA for that reason. I love transparency in salaries. I love that my salary was a matter of public record and that, you know, my raises were tied to time and service and location where I was. I just found that a very refreshing model as opposed to the academic mystery. Um, my position is funded, um, it, you know, this is very specific to my university, so I don't know how it is in other places, but we have, um, my position is jointly funded by Emory University and Emory Healthcare, which are two different places. So, you know, 70% of my salary comes from Emory Healthcare, and that's the clinical work that I do and how I generate income. And then 30% is from Emory University, which is sort of the academic side of things. You can buy out particular amounts of your time depending on your grant funding. So if I've got an R01, I can potentially buy out a couple of days of clinical time or 100% of my clinical time, which is how you do it. Um, because again, I need to feed my family and I don't want to be completely reliant on grant funding to fund my own salary. I like doing the clinical work um, because yay, I get to teach and B, it's a steady source of income. Um, and that's generally how my salary is funded. I'm a, <clears throat> in the traditional psychology department. So um, it's a salary position, uh, hard funding um, and nine months uh, appointment. Um, so I think that's pretty easy. 
uh, negotiating. I think it really gets into your unique situation if you have grant funding as you come in um, and also what you're going to need to start up your lab and be successful in that environment. I think um, your salary is one part of the negotiation, but I think you want to think broadly in terms of like, what are you going to need in the next few years to really get your research program off the ground? Um, and the salary is just one part of that. Uh, but there's a lot of public data in terms of what you know, people get in teaching institutions and research institutions and, and so forth. And a lot of state institutions have their university uh, salaries as public information as well. Yep. Uh, the TCN salary survey can actually be an invaluable tool. Um, and particularly on the medical side of things, I think it's important to know, you know, sometimes, so, you know, at Emory, they say PhDs and MDs have parity. And I said, all right, what are you paying that MD? Um, because, you know, if it's real parity, I want it, you know, you need to pay the PhD the same amount um, and, you know, say, okay, well, this is the 50th percentile of, you know, this particular income bracket. So I'm looking to be at 75 and then you sort of negotiate from there. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a good overview and kind of something to start thinking about. And we'll link the TCN, the most recent article, um, the salary survey on the website with the lecture. So thank you all so much. This was really wonderful. Um, I know there are way more questions than we could get to, but I think this was a good first step. So we really appreciate your time for being here today. Thank you everybody for attending. Thanks for the questions. You know, I'm sure we're speaking for me. I'd be happy to come back if there was interest. Yeah, yeah. Same here. If, if, yeah. If, 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 yeah, I, I agree. I don't, I'm happy to come back if, if people have questions and um, I enjoy hearing about Suzanne and Michael's uh, road here too and what they're doing. So yeah, it's, it's fun to hear what other people are doing yeah. in this field. There's a lot, like, hopefully you see that there's a lot of variability and I wish there was like a straight private practice person here to really sort of round it all out, but you know, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to have someone um, in the future as well. We appreciate it. So thank you all. Thank have you. Thanks everyone. Everyone. Bye-bye.